You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Barbell Logic podcast. I'm your guest host, Jonathan Sullivan, joined once again by Noah Hayden. We're very pleased today to be joined by Grace Steel athlete John Clausen. Some of you may know about him. He's our 94 year old athlete at Grace Steel. And today we're going to talk about how we train masters at Grace Steel and at Barbell Logic, our proper approach to that particular population with a special emphasis on exercise selection in that population. Once again, our guest interviewer is going to be Coach Noah Hayden. He's a Barbell Logic online coach, and he's my associate coach here at Grace Seal. Thanks for joining us, Noah. Howdy. And John, thanks for coming in today. My pleasure. All right, Noah, take it away. After talking about all of the sort of standard exercise prescriptions on the last episode, we have to address that elephant in the room, which is as people age, they tend to accumulate injuries and uh, conditions develop or advance, uh, joints get replaced, mobility changes, and all that stuff has to be dealt with, which requires some modifications to that sort of conventional approach. And what better guest for us to have on this topic than a man who has accumulated many things in his lifetime, John. So uh, John is a, a great example of a lifter needing not special, but specific modifications for his situation. Individually tailored right. modifications for an athlete in the 10th decade of life. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a pretty interesting guy. So that's <laughs> is, good too. He is indeed. So this is the part where we ask you to tell us about yourself, John. Well, I'll talk a little bit about myself. I was born in 1926, November 25th, so... Coach is a little premature in making me 94. Oh, excuse me, 93. But, All right. uh, yeah, my insurance age is 94, so we'll go with that. Well, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. I grew up there, went to school there. When I was 18, well, I graduated from high school when I was 17. So I was able to get in a, a year of uh, college at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, before being drafted into the Army in uh, March of 1945. So, And for those listeners who may not be aware, there there were some ongoing issues in 1945 that made being drafted into the Army at that particular time in history a a unique prospect. Yeah, World War II was Mm -hmm. still on. Uh, on both fronts, both in Europe and in the South Pacific. But shortly, I got drafted. I I got a year of school in college, and I went into the Army for a little over a year and a half. And the war ended about a couple weeks after I was drafted in Europe, and we went through uh, infantry basic training. I was trained to be a infantry replacement to uh, bolster the armed forces uh, in the invasion of Japan. And the uh, atomic bombs were dropped in August, and that was about the time that I completed basic training. So I continued on in the Army uh, uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia, for another year, infantry radio, and was discharged in forty six. Did you go back to college after that? Yeah, I, I came back to Omaha, matriculated back into Iowa State, and I went three and a half years on the GI Bill. I uh, majored in general ag. Originally, I was going to join my dad in his farm management and uh, real estate business, but uh, I changed my mind. I wanted to utilize some artistic abilities I had, so I got a degree in landscape architecture. And uh, so that went on, and the uh, final year of school in, uh, at Iowa State, I got my degree. 
got a job in California as a planning technician in the San Joaquin Valley, applied for and got a scholarship to Cal, Berkeley. Well, I went back and got a master's degree in landscape architecture. So here I was all set up to go into city planning, and there were a few changes in my life about that time, and I ended up going back to uh, Omaha and joining my dad in his business, utilizing what uh, education I had, both in agriculture and in landscape architecture. So it turned out that I uh, owned the business, John P. Clausen Company, and we managed farms in three or four states, in Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, Kansas, Little and Missouri, and uh, that went on. Later, I sold my business and went in with a bigger company, did the same work, but didn't have the headaches of... Uh, Running a business. Running a business. Pretty large business. Which, yeah. Which yeah. some of us present at this table know about. Yeah. Anyway, uh, in 1992, I retired. Mary and I, my late wife, and I had five children. And uh, they were all gone except our youngest, who was a... Uh, had uh, physical handicaps, he had cerebral palsy. So the three of us decided to move to Oregon where the temperature was a little more cooperative and for Aaron, our son, who used a wheelchair. So we moved to uh, Oregon, Hillsboro, bedroom to Portland. And uh, I lived there for 22 years. Mary died nine years ago, and uh, about seven years ago, I'd say, I decided that I, I was 85, 86, 87. It's time for me to get a little help, and I had two daughters living in Michigan. So I moved to Michigan and uh, found a home and retirement facility where I live now for about six and a half years. Well, while I was here, and now we're getting into the ex ex exercise part, mm -hmm. and I was feeling like I was a little old. I, was, I wasn't moving well. In my younger days, I did a lot of jogging, so aerobically I had taken care of myself, but uh, otherwise the musculature had uh, kind of disappeared, and I felt that I needed some strength training. Why strength training specifically? Like, where did you... Um... Well, one, one of the reasons that triggered me, I could see other people in the uh, independent living uh, facility where I lived. Uh, falls were always a danger. Sure, sure. And, and that was a critical part. And and I, uh, I love living. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I knew I was I was Good. I was starting to push the envelope a little bit there. Yeah. And I thought, well, I've been blessed with a few extra years. Let's see what we can do with it. And I also like to read, so I'd been reading quite a bit of Deepak Chopra. He's written about a hundred books. He's an MD who has gotten into uh holistic medicine and quantum physics and that sort of thing. It interested me, and part of his research and experience was that uh, older people, and I'm, I'm speaking about people my age at that time in the 80s, they could uh, accommodate a strenuous exercise. So I started looking around, and I checked with the staff at the place I was living, and they looked around, and they found this uh, Dr. Jonathan Sullivan, who was working with older adults in, in weight training. So we had Sully come over to our place and uh, make a presentation 
with the possibility of uh, setting up some kind of a facility in, in our uh, retirement facility to accommodate our patrons there, our tenants. And what, and what I remember about that is, uh, obviously, that never materialized. We never really developed a facility over there at that place. And so John was like, well, I, yeah, okay, but I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, and so he in, instead of us going to him, he came to us. Yeah, so he came, made his presentation. I'd done a little research, and I kind of indicated uh, there were some studies made in Canada, I think, and I asked Dr. Sullivan if he was aware of it, and he was very receptive, and he said yes, and he he didn't take over. He let me do the lead, and uh, he, of course, knew all about these studies, and uh, yeah, I said, well, you, maybe you'd like to see where I live, and we went up, took a look at my apartment, and about that time, I can remember, as we were walking out, I said, you know, I'd like to get into the program. Could we set up something? Sure. He said, let's make an appointment. So that's what we did. And in about a week or two, I went to the gym, and uh, that's where I lifted the broomstick and got up out of the chair. And So, you know, that... That kind of leads us nicely into in what we do here. So, uh, I, and I remember that day very, very clearly because, you know, you were a couple of decades older than the oldest client I had worked with at that time, I think, with maybe one exception, Ann Bizarre. And I remember being a little bit nervous about it. And your daughter, Sue, came with you. And like, so this was all under her eagle eye. I remember Sue came the first couple of sessions to sort of keep an eye on me and, uh, you know, make sure I didn't break you. And, <laughs> and after a couple of sessions, she's like, yeah, okay, this is fine. And, and like, <laughs> she's, she stopped coming after that. But I remember that first session and that's what we do. It was just a, a slightly more careful and nervous version of what we do with everybody else. We brought you in and we assessed your, your movement patterns. We, and I was 89 at that time. 89. Just to set the, it was, 2016. 2016. Yeah. So we, you know, we were able to ascertain pretty quickly that you were not going to be able to do the overhead press. We weren't even trying to have you do a barbell squat at first. We just wanted to see whether you could sit down and stand up out of a chair under your own power. I can't remember whether we had you do a kettlebell deadlift at first or you not. Did. Yeah. And so we determined also very, very quickly that you wouldn't be able to do a standard bench press. Yeah, I couldn't stand up straight. I still can't. Right. And, but you also couldn't lay down flat. That's right. Com completely right. horizontally yeah, flat. Yeah, I couldn't lay completely horizontally. You got right. a, little, a little bit of, of kyphosis of the upper back. But it was basically the same thing that we do for everybody else. So, okay, he, he can do squats out of a chair. Yeah. I don't think he ever had to do assisted chair squats. He was able to just sit in the chair and squat his way up. And we very quickly determined, okay, overhead press, not for you. You're not going to be able to lock the bar out over your shoulder. So we had you doing curls pretty yeah. much from the start. And then an incline bench press. So we elevated the bench so that you could bench press at an angle. And you were able to go from kettlebell deadlifts to standard deadlifts pretty quickly. And deadlift was always your strongest exercise in fact, as we'll discuss later, you ended up taking the deadlift to competition. Yes. And then we were able to progress you over time from plain old standing out of a chair squats. That was your squat for a while. And then we were able to have you goblet squat. So we went through a phase where you were goblet squatting. And then we had you do barbell squats. We put the straps on the barbell, on a 15-pound barbell, so that you could hold the bar on your back. And once we got you strong enough, we got you to the point where you could start with the safety bar. And that's what you did going forward. You started with that, with that heavy safety yeah, bar. Yeah, the safety bar weighs 70 pounds. Well, we think so. There, there, uh, actually, there's been some questions raised about oh. that, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so you were able to safety bar squat. 
And then we were able to add weight to that. And I believe we've gotten you up to a 170, 175 pound safety bar squat before the COVID pandemic hit. Yeah, I think it was around 170. Yeah. That's really fantastic. It is fantastic, especially because, you know, our listeners can't see him, but John, he's a very tall, lanky guy, but it's a good day when he comes in and tells me that his body weight is 200 pounds. So that's pretty extraordinary for somebody in their 10th decade to be squatting 170 pounds. And these are below parallel squats, by the way, people, that Mr. Clausen does. Knees out, hip drive, the whole thing. The whole thing is there. The only thing that's different is that he's doing it with a safety bar uh, because he can't hold the bar well, securely and I on use, his back. I use a box, too. Yeah, but the box, you never rest your weight on the box. No, that's for measurement. Right. The reason we use the box in your case is because the proprioception, for whatever reason, just isn't there anymore. You don't know whether you're high or deep. You know, we had the problem of you actually going too deep for a little while and getting too relaxed in the bottom. And then your very next rep, you'd be like six inches high. So you just didn't know where your butt was. So we put this like really flimsy little box. It wouldn't support his weight, especially with a bar on his back. Put this box under him so that he touches it and he knows he's to depth and he drives. So it's a it's a box squat with safety bar, but it is below parallel and you're not resting on the box. Bench press, we've gotten you to... We're about 90 pounds. 90 is a pounds, PR. yeah. Uh, curls, who cares what you curl? I mean, it's like, I think we've gotten you up to <laughs> 65 pounds, something like that on the curls. And those are for sets of eight. We have you do those kind of like hypertrophy sets. And then there's your deadlift. And uh, you've deadlifted 250 pounds in the gym. Yes. And then John made an extraordinary journey uh, a couple of years ago now. Has it been a couple of years or just a year? No, time's going a little faster for yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's about a year. Yeah, yeah. 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 Rub it, it in, John. It was the last October, so I think. So he got it in his head, probably infected by Carson Laufer, uh, the, you know, this idea in his head that he wanted to go to a strengthlifting meet and compete the deadlift. He couldn't compete the press and he couldn't compete the squat, but he could compete the deadlift. And so we trained for that. And the independent living facility where you live, decided that they were going to make a, a documentary about that. Mm -hmm. And I would strongly encourage anybody listening to this podcast to go and check that out. It's available on Vimeo. Just go to Vimeo and search for Outlifting Life, Outlifting Life with John Clausen. And it is a, a beautifully produced documentary. Yeah, very um, well done. Yeah, very well done. And you will see what happened when John Clausen... Uh, went to Chicago and deadlifted 235 pounds in competition. It's just an extraordinary achievement and really a beautiful documentary about that whole process and uh, a pretty good look at your life too. I mean, we get to meet your family, we get to meet Aaron and your daughters and learn about your life and we get to meet your friends at the Independence Village. And I think what happens in that documentary is it shows us what it can be like yeah. to be in the eighth or ninth or 10th decade of life, what it can be. I mean, that's what you are. You're an example of what life uh, at the extreme of age can be, and it can be pretty amazing. And that's you. One thing came out of that too. There was a group of us men, there were six of us, all in our 90s. The Mustangers. And we call ourselves the Mustangs. Yeah. Five of the men sat at one table, and it was table 51, and and uh, four of us were World War II vets, and two of us were Korean vets. And uh, so we called ourselves the Mustangs, and we kind of brought them into the movie, too. There are only five of us left now. Mm-hmm. One of us left us uh, here about uh, two months ago. But uh, our ages range from 91 to 99. One of our parties going to be 100 next year. So that's been good. And we still meet uh, several times a week, even when, we're, even when we were in lockdown because uh, of the virus. So your training was really on track before this whole pandemic hit. And now that the world is in lockdown and you can't really come to the Grace Deal Clinic anymore, mm -hmm. 
at least for a little while longer, you won't be here on the platform with us. Hopefully we'll be able to get you back in the gym here within a month or three. But in the meantime, you've been on lockdown. And of course, that's been a perfect excuse for you to not train. So you, you haven't been training, right? Taking it easy. Taking it easy? Well, I've been training. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got some weights from one of my, two of my sons-in-law. And uh, I was doing some workouts thinking I was doing pretty good and coach. Sully comes up with a lockdown program, which made it harder. But, uh, yeah, so I've been working out, uh, according to that program, three times a week, an hour each session, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I do squats. I do air squats, uh, goblet squats, uh, curls. Dumbbell curls, yeah. And... Uh, RDLs, R Romanian deadlifts, and we've weighted them. Uh, I I don't I can't use the barbell where I'm at. I don't have that kind of equipment, but I I do have dumbbells and weights, and it's surprising. I almost dislike doing those exercises when I was coming in the gym, but uh, so I know that I'm working at. Uh, my limits for weights, and I'm glad I'm doing them. I would call it a maintenance program, but... Uh, it's kind of a maintenance program, and when you come back, you know, you're not the only person that we've had on this lockdown program, and what we have found consistently is the athletes who've done the lockdown program with whatever it is that they can, when they come back, they're better off than the athletes who didn't. The, Absolutely. The one, you know, it... it Certain people have said, well, these lockdown programs are useless, these body weight programs. They're not useless. They help us preserve the movement patterns. They help us stay in the habit of training. They help us maintain some level of strength. So when you come back, you're not going to be doing 170-pound squats and 235-pound deadlifts, but you'll be much stronger than you were, and it will take us a lot less time to get us back into something like the range where you were, where you were lifting before. And... I couldn't be prouder of you. I mean, he never misses a workout unless he's got like a doctor's appointment or something like that. Three times a week, you know, he's there. Once again, Barbell Logic has very, very generously allowed us to use their platform for our in-person clients uh, during the lockdown. So John is, is training and uploading his videos to True Coach, and we have a telephone conversation pretty much once a week, every now and then we miss, but... Pretty much once a week we check in and um, he's been very, very dedicated, very, very disciplined about the whole thing. And, um, and as he was just alluding, like John doesn't actually, I don't think he actually enjoys working out all that much. You know, he's like, he's like an experienced lifter. He's like a late intermediate lifter. Right. I remember once somebody, um, I was on a panel with Jim Wendler and somebody said like, what's your favorite exercise? And he's like, yeah, I've been doing this long enough. I hate them all. You know, exactly. Yeah. And so John's kind of at that stage. He's an advanced lifter, really an elite lifter for his demographic. So I couldn't be prouder of you. You've shown real diligence, real discipline and consistency. And when you do come back to Gray Steel, you're going to be glad that you did those things. So, so far, this is all, you know, it's pretty triumphant. You found us. You've done really, really well here. But I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking to us a little bit about the challenges. I, like, can what, we can we start with how has this uh, pandemic situation yeah. been challenging mentally and emotionally? Well, I, I was going to say about the regular exercises. It's it's really you know this lockdown thing. This is Groundhog Day revisited. <laughs> In the worst Some way. Days you, you don't know what day it is, what time yeah. of day it is, whether it's day or night. And this is a, an ancillary blessing to these exercises. It centers you to do those four exercises three times a week. It centers you. It, it kind of brings you back into reality. Some structure it, to your day. That's the word, yeah. Noah. Structure. It gives you a structure. 
And I just know that on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, my mornings, are, even though I only work out for an hour, it occupies the full morning. I have to get up at a certain time, eat breakfast at a certain time, always eat breakfast, push the protein. I've quit logging my meals. I was tired of trying to figure out how many calories I was getting. But I've pushed the protein as much as I can try and hold my weight up. My weight at one time before I was exercising, I was up to around 210, 210 pounds. And then somewhere along the line, I went into a free fall and I went down to 195. I'm back to 201 now. Yeah, and your coach fussed at you. Yeah, he fusses <laughs> at me. Yeah, But, you know, like he's always done by like 9.30. Like by 9.30, he's, his workout is done. Well, I try and stay on about the same as my schedule here. If everybody half your age had that much discipline and consistency, the world would be a better place. You know, we, <laughs> you know? we haven't talked about uh, programming yet. That'll be a future episode. Yeah. But it's funny that, as has been said many times before, the key ingredient is consistency, making it a habit that you stick to yeah, every day, no yeah. matter what. The particular set rep scheme and all that stuff is secondary to like, Absolutely. yeah, just show up and do it every single time. And, and that's where you're strong. Like you show up and even before the lockdown, like you don't miss workouts. You show up and you do what you're supposed to do. You do what's on your board every single time. So yeah, that's pretty amazing. Well, I, I think in terms of the demographic, you know, in your 90s, you, you, you Google that. I, th I think the population, uh, the census in 2010 said there was something like uh, 2.9 million people 90 years old and older in the United States. Well, that's a demographic of less than 1% of the population. Now, when those, the idea comes to me that I would like to quit quit the program, I think, well, hell, I've got four years invested in this already, and I haven't missed. It would be sacrilegious to quit now. So I've got a new goal, Coach. I hate to spring it on it, me all of a sudden in public. Spring it yeah. on because you're going to force me to do it, but I, I'd like <laughs> to go to 100 and be able to deadlift 200 pounds at 100 years old. Why only 200? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're... Yeah, yeah, you're in this. You're in this for the long haul. And you know, we've talked a, a little bit about this before. You know, the mortality curves as we get older. Once you're past fifty, your mortality rises steadily from decade to decade. In other words, your chance of dying rises steadily from decade to decade until you get to be about eighty, eighty-five, and then it levels off. Right. So, like genetically, environmentally, developmentally, you've already like passed all the big filters by that point. Like, so, you know, you're obviously the fittest of the fit for your age and you've made it this far. So what happens is we find that people in their eighties, their mortality starts to level off and the death rate stops increasing. And then we have somebody like you who's in an even smaller demographic. You're not just the over 90, you're the over 90 athlete. Like you pay attention to your sleep, you pay attention to your physical exercise, you pay attention to what you eat. And the other thing I've noticed about you is you're highly engaged. You're engaged socially and you're engaged intellectually. Like this guy is always reading a book. And, and by book, I don't mean like, you know, People Magazine or something like that. There was uh, that book of philosophy that you were reading by that one Jesuit scholar that yeah. you're reading that I still want to get my hands on. Yeah, I almost brought it today, but I want to review it before I gave it to yeah, him. Yeah, so he's always reading something, and he's always reading something that's kind of challenging, like not lightweight yeah. material. Like he doesn't read Harlequin romances, you know. He, so you are engaged in every dimension of your existence. You're engaged with family and friends and you're constantly trying to learn more about the world and about yourself. You're engaged physically, you're engaged with your nutrition and all of your recovery variables. 
you are the very essence of an athlete of aging. Like that's you, that's who you are. And so I think when I look at somebody like you and you tell me maybe sort of half joking, I want to do a 200 pound deadlift when I'm a hundred is not a joke. I mean, I think there's a pretty darn good chance that that's Yeah, and the reason I didn't happen. want to say anything, you were already questioning me on the 200 pounds. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I think 200 pounds, you I think you're- You don't even like it when I set a limit. I think you're aiming low. <laughs> I think you're aiming low. And you knew I was, I was going to say that. So yeah. again, I want to get back a little bit though, because you're in a unique demographic, you face unique challenges. So what are those? Well, I tell you, the 70s, you're still young. The 80s, you get along just fine. But the 90s, well, they're tough. And uh, not everybody has an opportunity to see how tough they are. But uh, there, are, there are limitations. I've got a touch of Parkinson's, and I've got some neuropathy. My fingers are numb, and it's hard for me to tie my shoes sometimes, but I can still lift weights. <laughs> and I think probably, I think you said it once, the squat is uh, the queen of the exercises. And as long as I can uh, squat down and pick up stuff off the floor, that, that's where my strength is. It isn't where the muscles show up. It's, it's that muscle chain through your whole body that's, that's uh, making you able to go day by day. Absolutely true. On the other hand, you know, he wears a short sleeve shirt when he works out, and I see his videos three times a week. And because, we, you know, he doesn't have a facility to bench there. So before we were having right. curls once a week and bench once a week, now his upper body stuff is all curls. And he's starting to get a little jacked. I mean, he's got some pythons <laughs> hanging off his shoulders now. He's, he's, he's Definitely getting some hypertrophy effect there. Looking pretty good. Yeah. So, so did I answer you, your question on the... Yeah, I mean, so what I'm hearing from you is that there's sort of a qualitative difference between the 10th decade and the 9th decade. Absolutely, you yeah. nailed it. Yeah. So, but it didn't stop you. And, you know, and we have had to overcome some challenges. We had a little bit of an issue with an unexplained tachycardia that had to be investigated and i had a and, right a right knee and a left shoulder problem right and we have to work around those and then it was a few years ago when i started to notice that you had that pill rolling tremor yeah and we got you investigated for that and it turns out you have a, a touch of parkinson's it doesn't seem to be particularly progressive though which is good and we've worked pretty closely i think with your physicians over time, yeah, they, and uh, we've been pretty blessed that they're on board. Yeah, they all they all like it when I come in. They bring the the, the young students in because I uh, do my medicine in uh, U of M, and uh, it's a teaching facility. So they like to the docs like to bring in the younger ones to see me, and uh, I show off for them. Yeah, I imagine they get an earful. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, if someone else your age isn't happy with their level of independence, what advice would you give them? Well, it's depending on nobody's come up and saying, I, I want to follow the program you're on. I don't proselyte, but uh, everybody knows they made a movie about uh, my competition. And uh, I've heard a lot of stories where people talk about their parents and how they use me as an example of someone that can do some difficult things, and, that, and that's what I want. I, d I didn't know how to explain what I was doing to others, and I figured, well, I'll just do it myself and see how things work out. And uh, there have been opportunities to publicize it, and uh, it's not for me, it's for everybody. If they can see an example of someone that can do this. I'm sure there's 90-year-old people that are, uh, around the world that are doing stuff like this, but I'm not reading about them. Not a lot of them. Yeah, not so, many. So, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, there's nothing that can change the simple fact that, you know, you're a pretty 
inspirational figure. And, you know, I know for a fact that you have inspired a lot of people. And, you know, we've had people come to us and say, yeah, I saw that. And like, I feel like I'm out of excuses now. Like, right. So and we, we made our own documentary about you a few years ago. And then Independence Village made this much more highly produced uh, documentary. And we've actually written you up as a case report and our approach to your programming and so on. And I think that you are an inspirational figure and you are an extraordinary figure. And I think what we're all working towards is a world where you wouldn't be, right? Where you wouldn't be so extraordinary and that where you would wouldn't be, nice. be, it wouldn't be that unusual for somebody your age to be under the bar and using that particular form of exercise medicine to hang on to their muscle and their bone and their function and their independence. But for now, you know, we don't live in that world. And I think that this is a big part of your legacy. You're sort of a, 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 pioneer for this approach to healthy aging. I would hope that it would happen. And the one thing you have to watch out for, just let your ego get out of the way and just do the program and things will fall into place. I think we're riding a, an upward curve. You got it right, Sully. I think uh, this is happening and it'll be more commonplace. In 10 years, it'll be pretty commonplace. And we just have to break down the barriers to implementing programs like this. Some, something to look forward to 10 years from now. We'll do another podcast with you. We'll talk about your 260-pound deadlift and, <laughs> uh, and how far we've, we've come. I won't make any comments on that. <laughs> <laughs> once, I got to tell you, well, once he finished the set, or maybe it was the Prowler. John pushes the Prowler. And um, walks back to his chair and sits down and says, "This is elder abuse." <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and then he got up and did his next power prowler. Right. But you know, the, the prowler is necessary. I don't like it, but it's a way to bolster your aerobics and your, uh, your stamina. Stamina, absolutely. And I have a stamina problem, and uh, so, join the club. Yeah. I'll be glad to get back into that. That would be something else to bitch about. Yeah, those, yeah. <laughs> yeah, your first your first couple of Prowler pushes are, you've pushed the new Prowler, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, yeah. I like it. It's yeah. much better. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's a little heavier. It definitely it's is. A, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a little heavier. The dynamics are a little different. You can get down at it better. Mm -hmm. You'll probably be the the last person to come back to clinic because of your demographic and not so much even because of your demographic, but because of the demographic of those around you were at pains to make sure that this environment is actually absolutely safe for you and for those that you come into contact with on a daily basis, but you will be coming back. And, you know, I've told you this before, but you are very, very sorely missed here. It is been a big I hole. appreciate that. And I've missed coming to the gym, the clinic, now we call it. Yeah. But uh, Ann Buzard is just not the same without you around. Yeah. Well, she's been my training partner since day one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think she, uh, she and I are probably two of your better attendees, too. Oh, yeah. Never misses. Never misses. Yeah. yeah. You are not the truants. We have we have one or two truants, but uh, that's not, not many, true. really. Not, not many, well, not many. No, it's been a great thing for my life. I've been doing it now for going on four and a half years, and I can't imagine how the time has gone by that I keep coming back each time. It's been great. It's been great for us too, and it's it, it's a program that I I want to see expand, and I, it is. I think we're on the way, and. Uh, There'll be more 90-year-olds coming into this. Yeah, but you were the pioneer. Well, you are a great example, John. I remember the first time that I met you. You stood up and introduced yourself. You shook my hand, and instantly I felt it was obvious how present you were in the moment. And you don't always feel that from even people my age. It was striking a little bit, mm -hmm. to be frank. And I think a lot of people feel that from you. I know that you don't 
proselytize what you're doing is such a great thing to every person that, that you pass. But I think your example is all the uh, all the proselytizing that anyone needs. Yeah, he's an evangelist it, by example. It it's speaks his for example itself. That, yeah, yeah, exactly. It speaks for itself. You speak for yourself. Just the way you are. And Noah's right. Like anybody who's ever been around you, like you are utterly present. Which is the best kind of message. Yep. You know? Well, I'm glad to get that feedback because that's what I intended all along. I didn't quite know. You take it day by day. You live in the present. And that movie being made was uh, nothing that I envisioned at all. It it just came about, but it uh, certainly disseminates the information that I want to do. At 93 years old, you're, you know, one of the most vibrantly alive people I've ever known. And and now you're strong, too. Go yep. get him. Thanks. So, uh, wow, I don't know how to do any better than that. Yeah. John Clausen, you are missed, you are valued, and you are very special. Thank you so much for coming in today to talk to us and to it's our audience. It's been great being here with you guys. You'll be back soon. Noah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, and thank you all for listening to this special Barbell Logic series on the Barbell Prescription. Our guest today has been John Clausen, and I've been joined by my associate, Noah Hayden, Barbell Logic and professional barbell coach. And I hope you'll join us next time. When we, what are we talking about next time? We're talking about programming for masters with yeah. our guest, Laura Welsher. So please join us then. Until then, this is Barbell Logic signing off. See ya.